Hi, Ninja Nerds. In this video, we're going to be talking about pacemakers. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up, comment down below, don't forget to subscribe, and also check out ninjanerd.org where we have all of our notes and illustrations out for you, for you guys to watch with these, use with these lectures. So let's get into it. And I am standing right now on a stool. Uh, so yeah, I'm too short and Rob didn't like the shot. So I'm going to be on a stool. So here we go. Um, pacemakers are a device that electronically stimulate the heart. So let's walk it back to anatomy and physiology and think about the heart. The heart, we know, has our four chambers, our atria and our ventricles, and it has its own uh, conduction system within the heart. And that all starts with our SA node and our AV node, and they are allowing to pace the heart. They make our pace. So when the heart does beat in rhythm, we are able to catch that on an EKG, and we are also to feel the, the beat with the pulse when we check pulses. So. With that, when we want to place a pacemaker in, that means something in the heart is not working correctly. And the SA node and the AV node are typically our pacemakers. So when they are not working correctly, then we have to think, mm, we might have to put in our own pacemaker. And with the pacemaker, I just want you guys to understand that it is an, this external device here. And there's a couple different ways that it can work. We can have one that is called a single chamber that'll just go in and it can stimulate our right atria or our right ventricle. We have one that can also have another lead that comes in and it pierces through the middle here and it can stimulate our left ventricle. And we have one that can do all three, right atria, right ventricle, and left ventricle. And they all have different names, but I just want you to understand that there are different types of pacemaker leads that we can have. And with that, we can also have different types of pacemakers. So we have two types here. We have our temporary and our permanent. And with these, we're gonna talk through as to when a patient needs which kind. So with our transcutaneous, we have transcutaneous. We know cutaneous is skin, and we know the word trans means to go through. So transcutaneous means that it's going to go through the skin, so through skin, or on skin, because we're gonna have it on the skin. And this is the one that we use in an emergency. This is the one where we have a patient, patient that comes in and they are been having these syncopal episodes or dizzy spells every once in a while and they came in today because they passed out and knocked their head and we put them on the EKG and we see uh oh they keep braiding down or they're going from maybe in the high 60s lower 60s and they're going down to the 40s they eventually pass out and then boom come back through so transcutaneous is the one that we place on top it's going to send those stimulation through to the heart and you guessed it if it's going through the heart then there's one other thing that we got to write down here it is painful typically we give the patient some type of medication in order to make this feel a lot better and transcutaneous are the ones we use in an emergency so hopefully within the near future they either end up with a different type of pacemaker or if they need a permanent they get the permanent put in so let's go in to talk about the epicardial epicardial is our type of pacemaker that we use that's going to go through the what or on the epicardium or the epicardial means on the outside of the heart so these are the pacemakers that we can use when we have open heart surgery so what we're looking at here is we have a patient that needs surgery and we have to do something where we need to keep the heart stimulated while we do something else within the chest so we are placing these electrodes on the outside of the heart and then we have endocardial and endocardial are the ones that we put they can go in through the IVC or the jugular vein And they are temporary where the pack is on the outside of the body, but the inside is endocardial and they just go into our, either our right atria, our right ventricle, or our left ventricle if it needs in order to keep the pace of the heart in a more substantial type of rhythm. And we always wanna think with the heart rate, we're, with the pacemaker, we're thinking about this heart because we want the heart to beat. And why do we want the heart to beat? We want the heart to beat so it's causing a cardiac output and that cardiac output is another word that we can use for perfusion right because once it, the cardiac output is good that means we're getting perfusion to things that we need to like our brain and our the outside of our heart and our other vital organs so now the patient is having trouble with their pacemaker or they are having an issue with their heart and they're going to need a permanent one and these are the ones the patients that typically have reoccurrent or chronic dysrhythmias things that are no longer being substantially controlled with temporary pacing or medications. 
and they also need it to be possibly paced atrial ventricular or both. So there's a couple different ways uh, that we can set up our pacemakers, different modes that we can put them in. So we're going to talk about them right now. Okay, Ninja Nerd, so now we've talked to talked through whether our patient is possibly going to get a temporary or a permanent pacemaker, or they went from a temporary to a permanent pacemaker. And I want you to understand that the big thing here is the permanent is surgically implanted or a light sedation implantation where they do eventually put these electrodes in, and they also put the pack within the body as well. So everything is contained within the body. Nothing is outside of the heart or outside of the body. But now we're gonna talk about the modes. And I want you to understand the modes because it's hard to make sense of them when you first hear them, but then as you understand the concept, it makes it a little easier. So we have two modes. We either have synchronous or asynchronous. So we have the A in the front. It's just like uh, systole or asystole, right? We have without or with. So we have synchronous, which is with the sync or like with the beat. So synchronous means to go with the beat and then asynchronous synchronous means without basically. So for me, the mode synchronous is also known as the demand mode. And what that means is that the heart is going to beat at its own rhythm and when it drops a beat or it drops lower than it needs to, that's when the pacemaker is going to demand the heart beat. So it's going to send those impulses for it. So when the heart is not working or like it should, or it drops below its rate that it needs to, it's going to detect the heart and it's gonna say, hmm, you're not doing what you need to do, so I'm gonna step in here and I'm gonna fire for you. And then it'll fire some um, electrical currents to help conduct the heart and conduct the pace. But then we have asynchronous. So asynchronous is our fixed rate, meaning with or without you, I'm going to be firing. So the pacemaker is like, I don't know what you're doing, but it's not working for us here. So I'm gonna set the pace and it's going to fire, and it's just gonna continuously fire, and it's gonna just continuously fire. So the asynchronous is the fixed rate. It's just gonna fire on its own, where synchronous is going to go with the heart. It's going to sync with the heart in order to find out the beat of the heart and then decide whether it's gonna fire or not. And we go in here and we think, what's going on with a person and why do they technically need a pacemaker? And typically, the patient that needs a pacemaker is somebody who is bradycardic, or we always at least focus on studying the ones with the bradycardic issues when their heart rates are lower than they need to be, because that's typically when we put a pacemaker in. But there are the rare occasions when the heart is really too high and out of whack, and we will also put a pacemaker in for that. So let's go through really quick, who's gonna be getting a pacemaker? We have the symptomatic bradycardia, meaning we have a patient who keeps braiding down, they keep going into like the 50s, the 40s, and they are symptomatic with it, and they are not being controlled with medications. So if it is not severe enough where they maybe wanna try some medications first, then those don't work, then we're gonna be looking at a patient that possibly is going to need a pacemaker. So symptomatic bradycardia, it's when we have that heart rate lower than 60, we have a change in neuro status, so someone who's getting dizzy, someone who's getting disoriented, someone who's having syncopal episodes, and then they're not getting response from medications helping with that symptomatic bradycardia. Then there's also the patients that have the complete heart blocks. So that's when we have the atria and the ventricle that are not in sync. They're firing on their own in different rhythms. That's not doing great for us as well. So we need to look into that and say, mm, you're in a complete heart block and we need to reset the pace or the rhythm of this heart and we're gonna be using a pacemaker for that. There's also the patients who have sick sinus syndrome. Again, this is the dysfunction of the SA node or the pacemaker of the heart. So the innate pacemaker that you are born with isn't doing what it needs to do. So we're going to put a pacemaker in for you in order to allow um, the heart to beat at a rhythm that is acceptable to help with perfusion. And then, like I said before, there are the patients that have the tachydysrhythmias or the too, too, too fast heart rates. The heart rates that are going too fast, they're going too wild, they're going out of control. And the patient typically has similar or same symptoms as that change in mental status. They're having other issues with their um, activities of daily living. And we have to look into possibly also allowing them to get a pacemaker because they are not perfusing as they need to as well. So let's go in and talk about what are the signs and symptoms of a patient that we think is possibly gonna be needing a pacemaker? And then when they do get a pacemaker placed, what is the education and the things that we're gonna be teaching them about taking care of themselves with that pacemaker? All right, engineers, so let's talk about what are some of the signs and symptoms here for a patient that possibly is gonna be getting a surgery to get a pacemaker implanted. So 
we're going to be thinking again, like I said before, you're going to think heart rate. If the heart rate's low, then we're going to have decreased perfusion. And that perfusion is going to cause all of those different issues or symptoms that our patient is going to have. So it's going to be that dizziness. It's going to be chest pain, angina, because they're not getting the perfusion to the heart muscles. They're going to have that fatigue and shortness of breath, possibly nausea because the heart might be doing some wacky rhythms, and then palpitations. So because of all that, we're going to be looking into thinking, hmm, what's going on with my patient? And when we do assess them, you might find other things that are going on, like an abnormality of the heart rate that's possibly too low or bradycardic, an abnormal EKG that's in either in a funny rhythm, it's bradycardic, it's really tachycardic, or it's got some blocks going on. Then we also have the jugular vein distension. We're having that decreased perfusion, that decreased flow through the heart and cardiac output. So we're looking through that back flow or that buildup of pressure and volume in our jugular vein. And then we could also have that altered mental status or the change in the neuro status. So eventually at some point we might say, hmm, this patient A may be a temporary pacemaker and some medication, or B might need some surgery to get a pacemaker implanted. And then when the day comes when they do need their pacemaker implanted, we're gonna be looking at what's going on with our patient. So the interventions are when the patient does get the pacemaker in, we want to make sure that we have a documentation of the type, the mode, the time and date, and the model of that pacemaker because we want to make sure we know what's going on in the body and it's a lot easier to know that when we put it in the day of. Also, we're going to be looking at their EKG and their telemetry. Is there any changes or differences or, you know, hopefully there are differences and there are better outcomes for our patient. Chest x-ray to make sure that we have everything in the correct place along with lung sounds, everything is sounding good. And then any medications that we want to give post-surgery like antibiotics and pain relief. And the biggest thing with these patients is we want to make sure that they aren't developing any signs that the leads are dislodged, those little leads that are going into the chambers of the heart are in places that they shouldn't be. For example, if the patient has hiccups, we want to make sure we are telling their healthcare provider whether they tell their healthcare provider or we do when they, if they're still in the hospital recovering because this is a sign that one of those leads potentially could be on the diaphragm and it's causing that hiccuping motion. So we want to make sure that we let them know about that. And then through their recovery, we also want to be focusing on their education. So patient just got a surgery completed and they're going to have a uh, sling in their arm for possibly one to two weeks depending on the patient's understanding of what's going on and their mentality. Are they able to uh, follow directions and comply with it. So they're going to be having a sling and that's for that minimal shoulder movement. We don't want to dislodge anything. We don't want to cause any issues with our pacemaker that's already been implanted and we work so hard to put in. They're going to carry the card at all times and again this is going to at least tell them the type of pacemaker that they have, the model that they have. It may also have the mode on there for them and a couple other serial numbers that are important if there's any type of recalls or changes or malfunctions with certain types of pacemakers. We want to make sure they know how to check their pulse daily. So you're telling them, you're teaching them how to check their radial pulse or they're checking their um, carotid if they don't know, can't find their radial. We want to make sure that they know no heavy lifting, swimming, or driving, okay? There's a bunch of different reasons to this, but this is a big NCLEX question where they want to put that into your select all that apply. And you want to start thinking about what happens when you do these motions. So patient just had a pacemaker put in, they're having issues with their heart. The first thing is the heavy lifting. If they're lifting something heavy, the tension of somebody to lift something heavy is to bear down. So when they do bear down and they try to lift, they have that potential to vagal themselves, right? And when you do that, that's going to cause some type of dysrhythmia in the heart. And we don't want to do that. We don't want to dislodge anything. We don't want the heart to go under any strenuous activity for a little while in order to allow things to heal and work properly. properly. We also don't want to go swimming because what happens when we swim? One, we're in water and we have an incision, so who would you know, think that was a good idea. Hopefully nobody. But also you're going to be, if you lift that shoulder, again, we don't want to be lifting that shoulder up until we're cleared by a doctor. And the last thing is driving. God forbid this patient is, first of all, in a sling, so now they're driving with one arm. They are on pain medication, and then they have a pacemaker that maybe it's not doing what it should do, and they pass out while they're driving. It's not a good idea either. So until we are cleared by a doctor, no heavy lifting, no swimming, and no driving. We also want to keep away from magnets, things like garage door openers, MRI machines, or anything else that could cause uh, dislodgement or movement of any of that within our, our heart. So best to just err on the sa side of safety and keep away from magnets. Also no TENS machines, okay? If you don't know what those are, those are the transcutaneous electric nerve stimulation, those machines that some people get to help with their muscles. You put them on your back to help relieve tension. You can put them you know, on your bicep if you're having fun with your friends to see if anyone can fight the tension. And 
The TENS machine is not good because it is sending electrical stimulation. And what is the pacemaker doing? It's sending electrical stimulation. So if you have a pacemaker here and you slap a TENS pad on the back of your um, shoulders here to get some relief, that could be sending signals and cause issues with the mode and function of our pacemaker. So we don't want to do that. So no TENS machines if you have a pacemaker. And then the last thing is we want to notify our healthcare provider if we have any of the following symptoms or anything else that seems abnormal for us, like dizziness, chest pain, fatigue, shortness of breath, nausea, palpitations. And those first couple there might seem very familiar. Well, they should be because they are the reasons you got a pacemaker put in. So if you start feeling that way, you want to let your healthcare provider know because that could be a sign that the pacemaker is not working the way it should be. And then we also want to look into fever and new drainage from the incision site. So we just had a surgery. We could be developing some type of infection, even though we're on antibiotics. Maybe something else is going on. And then that new drainage could also indicate some type of infection, like we have um, uh, drainage that is cloudy or milky looking or something that shouldn't be the way our drainage should look after a surgery. So that's it on pacemakers. I hope it made sense. I hope for you engineers it cleared up any things that you didn't know about pacemakers or at least cleared up some things so that when you go into your next exam or your NCLEX, you're able to answer these questions with confidence. So I hope it made sense. And as always, until next time. Thank you.